Hello, uh, my name's Kai Mason. I'm the Senior Project Officer for uh, Wessex Archaeology West and today I'm going to be talking about the surprising origins of an early Victorian public wash house at Bath Keys Waterside. Um, this is actually uh, part of a much larger project um, that we've just published as one of our occasional papers, um, but this is going to focus in on a, a specific aspect of it. So for this talk, uh, I'll give a very brief outline of the, the site itself, the development of the site, and then I'll move on to um, the, uh, the bathhouse itself. So Bath Keys is a major mixed-use development in the centre of Bath, and Bath Keys water size is the first phase of development there. Um, essentially, it's flood mitigation works along the river, um, which is creating a, a new riverside park um, and this all needs to happen before the, the main development gets going. So this is uh, Bath Keys Waterside when we uh, first arrived on site in 2016. On the south side of the river you've got a series of Victorian industrial buildings and on the north side uh, you've got some trees and shrub with a road running alongside um, above it. <clears throat> This road is actually about three metres above the level of the river and to create the new park uh, they needed to drop the level of the um, ground by about two metres. Uh, initial research showed that this would uncover significant archaeology of the mostly the 18th and 19th century and that this would need to be looked at before the um, or during the development. And the reason for dropping the ground here is basically so that when the river levels rise in flood Instead of going straight up, the river's got a bit of room to move sideways, and so it just goes out a little bit rather than going out, um, rather than going up, and um, this stops it flooding. So here's the excavation area. This is looking north towards the city of Bath. Um, it's about 250 metre long stretch along the riverside, about 20 metres deep. And what you can see here is that the site just after we've removed the, the sort of later rubble cover, covering everything. And you can see walls, old roads, and that kind of thing gradually um, getting uncovered. Um, these are mostly 18th and 19th century in date, um, but the earliest features are a lot earlier than this. So the site lies to the south of the historic core of Bath. Um, the, the core of Bath itself is essentially it's a Roman town um, with a, a late Roman wall around it uh, that gets rebuilt in the medieval period. And the city stays pretty much contained within these walls until fairly late on. Um, to the south, it's a floodplain. And we think the area that we excavated um, probably would have been in, within an active river channel probably up until the medieval period. In the medieval period uh, there is a substantial ditch is created here. This is a drain for the city's western geothermal hot springs. Um, this is uh, sometimes known as the Foss Dyke. Um, it's fairly substantial things, about six meters wide, over two meters deep, um, with a um, revetted bank on the, um, on the east side, um, which we found the remains of here. And this dates from the late medieval or very early post-medieval period. And there's very little evidence of uh, development um, up until the 18th century, really. Um, you've got a little bit of quarrying on, on the meadows, um, but they're mostly in agricultural use. Um, and then towards the end of the 17th or turn of the 18th century, uh, we get this little footbridge built. This is built sometime after about 1685. Um, and this would have been uh, for a, a riverside path. This all changes in the 1720s. Um, the main driver for change was the uh, conversion of the River Avon into a river navigation. Um, and this opened the river up to traffic between uh, Bath and the port of Bristol. And this was instrumental in the development of the town. It helped get cheaper building materials both in and out of the city, uh, which was experiencing a building boom caused by the, the growth of um, it, uh, the, the city as a spa town. So the earliest development we've got here, we've got uh, two key sides, um, one at the bottom of a new street called Avon Street and another one further to the east at Broadkey. So around the quayside, you've got a series of commercial buildings, warehouses, that kind of thing. 
um, basically stuff industries to do with uh, transportation of goods. Avon Street itself um, is laid out in the, the late uh, 1720s and most of the buildings along it, they're lodging houses um, built to accommodate wealthy visitors to the spa. Um, in the second half of the 18th century, um, things get a bit busier. Uh, very heavy built um, building along the quayside. Um, you can see here the it's a plan of the excavation area, and by the well by about 1720 uh, sorry 1770s, um, the quayside's pretty much built up all the way along, and the fields behind them follow pretty soon after. Um, so by this point, uh, many of the, the wealthy clients who'd come to stay in Avon Street initially, they'd moved away. They were beginning to stay in the newly built areas to the north and east of the city. And in their place came artisans, builders, servants, um, the people that made the city function, and people involved in transportation, um, either by barge or um, using horses and carts. You also get um, lots of industry developing, lot, well, very light industry, sort of, um, you've got uh, slaughterhouses, fellmongers, that's dealers in uh, sheepskins, parchment makers, uh, breweries, um, a lot of fairly smelly industries. And so you've got all this busy industrial activity and uh, commerce going along the quayside, and this kind of further drives the wealthy away but provides lots of work. So you've got lots of people moving in and gradually the back gardens get infilled with uh, very densely packed court housing and tenements, the sort of thing you might associate more with somewhere like Manchester or Glasgow. Um, and by this point, the area's reputation had taken a bit of a downturn. Avon Street had essentially become the city's red light district. So by the 19th century, um, it was very, very densely occupied. Um, there was somewhere in the region of about 10,000 people lived in this district. And the way it had developed, um, it had effectively been walled off from the rest of the city. You can see in the top photograph here, um, these very high rows of buildings, um, both to the west and northeast, um, three, four story high buildings with garrets. And these essentially formed a wall that um, shielded the, the lower lying Avon Street district from the, the wealthier parts of the city. And it's around this time that we start getting uh, some decent mapping available. Um, so when we started uh, looking at um, doing some archaeological work on the site, one of the first things we do is to look at the historic mapping and see what things we might find. Um, so there's various points of interest that um, jumped out. There's uh, foundries, various other industrial sites. Uh, there's a pottery, a clay tobacco pipe factory. But there's one thing um, that particularly drew my eye. So these two maps, uh, one from 1852 and the other from 1885. Um, the early one labelled baths and wash houses and the later one labelled uh, baths and laundries. So I thought um, this isn't a type of site I've, I've dug before. I wasn't quite sure what they'd looked like. Um, initially, I thought maybe it'd be something like a swimming baths. Um, so perhaps something with uh, glazed tiles. Um, so I was a bit curious to see what they would look like. Obviously, you can only tell so much from the outlines of a building on, on, a, on a map. So the first phase of our work at Bath Keys was digging a series of evaluation trenches, and one of these were targeted on the, um, the Milk Street Baths and Laundry. And this is what we uncovered, which wasn't quite what I was expecting. Um, what you're looking at here are two fairly substantial brick structures with sandstone slabs on top of them, and lots of evidence of very, very intense burning. These look more like industrial structures, the sort of thing you might expect if you were digging, say, a pottery site or another type of factory. And it made me realise I didn't really know how these buildings functioned and what we might expect when we uh, came to um, to look at them in more detail. So the first thing to do is do a bit of research.
So staying clean, washing yourself and your clothes um, for people who live in the West, um, it's not something we have to give a great deal of thought to. Um, you turn the tap on, it comes out hot or cold as you want, put your clothes in the washing machine, it's all done for you. It's um, hanging out, still a bit of a pain sometimes. Um, but otherwise, it's a fairly straightforward affair. This is quite different if you lived 100 or more years ago, um, especially if you're poor. If you were lucky enough to be of upper middle class or um, higher social status, you had servants to do work for you, so you didn't need to think about it. But if you were poor, there were quite a few um, barriers to um, being able to stay clean. First one's water. We use about 140 litres of water a day in the West. Um, that's about the weight of two adults. Fine if you just turn a tap. More of a problem if you've got to carry it. Um, and especially if you've got to carry it some distance. There was very little in the way of piped water. That wouldn't come along until later in the century. And for the very poor, uh, that wouldn't come along until a few decades into the 20th century. So for most people, uh, getting water involves a trip to the well or a pump and then carrying it back to the house, um, which obviously if you've got to carry to adults in weight, um, you might want to um, be a bit careful how much you use. The next problem is fuel. Um, heating up water requires a lot of fuel, coal, and um, if you're very poor, this is an extra expense. The next problem is time. Um, the wealthy obviously has servants to do all this work, um, but if you were poor, the chances were any um, adults and a lot of the children would have been at work most of the time. So you have to fit in the time, um, and it would generally be the women who were doing the work um, around your other work. And then there's the other problem is space. Um, in the more densely um, occupied urban areas, a uh, house that we today might consider as a reasonable sized family house, it wouldn't be unusual to find 20 or 30 people living in it. If you're lucky enough to have a bit of space outside to hang up the laundry on a dry day, it's, uh, that's doable. In the winter months, this becomes more of a problem, is actually physically having the space to hang things up and also having the space to have the privacy to be able to wash yourself. People were well aware of um, these problems and it was um, one of the things that was noted by wealthy members of society that the poor were dirty. Um, and it's around this time you get the phrase, the great unwashed is coined, it's in the 1830s. Um, a little bit earlier, you get the phrase, cleanliness is next to godliness. And this pretty much sums up how a lot of people thought about this. Being dirty was a moral failing. They just didn't think about how difficult it actually was for poorer people to get clean. And so it stayed. Um, people would have liked the poor to be a bit cleaner. It offended their sensibilities, but it didn't really affect them. And then something changed. So in 1831, um, something that we're unfortunately very familiar with at the moment, a new pandemic disease arrived in the country. This was cholera. Um, we now know this is the second cholera pandemic. Um, the first went pretty much unnoticed by Europeans because it never got here. Um, when it arrived in Europe and North America, it arrived in a population who had no natural immunity. Nobody had any idea how it spread. Uh, it was recognized that it seemed to thrive in, in dirty urban areas. And the prevailing scientific thought at the time was that it was spread by something called miasma. Um, and this is a, a, a type of bad air or bad smells um, that were thought to be given off by rotting food, um, excrement, basically anywhere dirty and smelly um, was considered to be unhealthy. And they were to an extent right, although not quite right about exactly how it spread. So cholera spread to all large urban areas in Britain. Bath was badly hit, Bristol, um, London, and Liverpool. And it was here in Liverpool that um, this woman, Kitty Wilkinson, um, she started offering her neighbors the use for boiler to clean their clothes. 
Um, she'd offer them uh, hot water and chloride of lime to uh, disinfect their clothes. Um, and this was with the idea that this would help to protect them against cholera by having clean clothes. And this was noticed by lo local politicians who were desperate for to be seen to be doing something and, and have any way of combating a disease that they had no, no knowledge of how to fight. So with the help of local politicians, they started campaigning for public wash houses to be available for the poor. And in 1842, the first um, public wash house was opened in Liverpool. During the 1840s, um, there started to be a national campaign for public wash houses to be provided. And this was part of a, a wider campaign for public health. Um, and it, this was around the time where the British government for the very first time started to accept that looking after the health of the population was something that they needed to be concerned with. Before this, it just wasn't considered their problem. So in 1846, you get the passing of the Public Baths and Wash Houses Act, um, which allowed local authorities to start raising funds to um, build public wash houses for the poor to use. Bath was a little bit ahead of the game. Uh, in 1845, the Baths and Laundry Society for the City of Bath was founded. Um, this was uh, founded by a chap called Lord Ashley, Charles Broderick and William Sutcliffe. Uh, these were all wealthy men who knew each other through their evangelical and uh, missionary activities. Um, Lord Ashley was he's by far the most prominent of them. He is um, one of the most important figures of social reform in the 19th century. Um, he single-handedly uh, helped get the passing of a whole series of acts that made it illegal for children to work down mines and factories and improve the conditions of women in work as well, amongst various other things. Um, William Sutcliffe went on to become MP for Bath, um, and they, they all benefited from their involvement in uh, their good works, in, increased their profile. So the Baths and Laundry Society, it was a charity. Um, there wasn't much in the way of uh, government provision for um, things like uh, the support of the poor, um, but it was supported by the city in that they provided their city architect, George Philip Manners and John Elkington Gill to design the baths. By the time the Baths and Wash Houses Act was passed, they already had plans and a plot to build the new bathhouse. Um, it was sited in the centre of the poorest district in Bath because that's where the need was greatest. And in 1847, it opened with a, a married couple, Henry and Eliza Cox, um, to um, people from Dorset as superintendents to run it. Um, Henry was responsible for the mechanical operation and overseeing the whole thing. And Eliza Cox, um, she would oversee the, the laundry aspect of it and act as a, a matron. So this is the site itself. Um, this is a view of the excavation area just after we finished removing the demolition roll from the top of it. And you can see here a whole uh, range of different phases of the building. So what you're essentially looking at is how it looked um, straight after it was demolished. Um, but there's various elements to it. Some of them are earlier than others. Um, we've got uh, boiler bases um, for steam engines, um, pump rooms, laundry, and the baths. So what I'll do now is I'll uh, break down how the, uh, how the building developed over time. So this is a plan of the earliest phase of the baths. It's pretty small. Um, it's, uh, there's an entrance with the lodgings for the superintendents, which is called the, the master's house. Um, they lived in fairly cramped accommodation over the entrance with the baths and laundry behind. Uh, next to that, you've got a pump room, um, which is powered by uh, a boiler, that provided um, steam for the, pump, for the pumping engine and uh, also heated the water. Uh, which, by the way, was pumped out of the river. Um, it was pumped out of the river, uh, filtered, and then stored on the roof. So this is the pump room. 
Um, and there's a feature which um, is noted in documents of the time as the well. It's not actually a well as such. It's more a kind of sump that would have housed the uh, the pumping gear. And you can see an iron pipe coming in from the side. Um, I don't know whether this is an inlet or an outlet pipe. It's most of the well, all of the machinery is gone now. And we're lucky enough to have a photograph of the um, eastern facade of the building. And this is pretty much how it would have looked when it was first built. There was no major changes to the external appearance of the building. Um, and on your left there, you can see the, the pump room, the building with two windows, and above it, uh, the reservoir. So the foundations of this are pretty massive because there's, there's quite a, a huge volume of water stored on the roof there. And then next to it, you've got the master's house, um, pretty cramped accommodation. L later on, it gets converted to um, be used as uh, part of the rest of the, um, the bathhouse. So these were the facilities. Um, one boiler that provided hot water and steam for the baths and the various bits of equipment and power for the um, steam engine that powered the various bits of equipment. Um, five baths with hot and cold water and 14 laundry tubs. And this was for a population of around 10,000. Clearly it wasn't going to be enough. And almost as soon as it opened, um, there was demand to increase the size of the building. It took a few years to gather the funds. And in 1854, the building was substantially enlarged. The increased capacity meant that they needed to build uh, new um, boilers. So there's a twin bank of Lancashire boilers get added. Um, the reason you have two is uh, they need to be cleaned and serviced every now and then. So you need one to be able to keep running while the other one's being fixed. Um, the main addition to the building was this laundry block. Um, you can see it divided into lots of little cubicles there um, with drains running alongside it. And the old um, part of the building that was used for baths and laundries, uh, this gets turned over exclusively to baths. Um, so you have male baths on the ground floor and women's baths on the upper floor. So these are the Lancashire boiler bases, um, which anyone who's worked on um, any sort of factory sites of the period will be familiar with. These are fairly standard forms um, they would have uh, big iron cylinders um, above them uh, with coal-fired uh, flues underneath um, the chimney base itself was truncated by uh, later disturbance so we didn't quite get that but the um, looking at the photographs that do exist it would have been about 23 meters high so it's, it's quite a substantial structure And this is the 1853 laundry block. Um, you can see all the little cubicles there. Um, we're not sure what the above ground parts of these cubicles uh, were made from. They could have been stone as the rest of the building, um, but more likely they would have been of iron or timber. Um, and these would have been removed when the building was demolished. And you can see the drains running alongside there. So this would have been a very wet room. The, the, the all the, the waste water being sluiced down there and back into the river. So the capacity was increased. Um, the three boilers uh, produced enough hot water for eight women's baths, 16 men's baths and 41 uh, laundry stations. Uh, there were also ironing rooms and drying areas and there would have been various machines for um, drying uh, essentially uh, big very primitive uh, tumble dryers with blown hot air um, and uh, ringing machines for, for squeezing out the water and drying cabinets where hot air would be blown through to uh, to dry the clothes off and all of this would have been powered by the steam engines um, the power would be moved around the building by uh, transmission shafts, um, iron, iron shafts uh, hung up on the ceiling with various belts um, driving other uh, moving parts all over the building. So it would have been a noisy place. You'd have had the sound of water rushing, steam, uh, the clanking of all the machinery turning, not to mention um, the chatter of all the people in there. Um, 
the laundry itself is almost certainly an exclusively female space and it probably would have been a fairly uh, major part of people's social lives. This was pretty much the only all-female space available in this area um, and it was the only large public space that wasn't either a pub or somewhere where you went to worship. Um, so for nearly a century this would have been um, quite an important part of um, people's lives and women's lives in particular. There's no major changes later in the century. Um, probably the most significant occurred in the 1870s. Um, as people were gradually becoming aware of the real means that uh, diseases were transmitted, um, namely pathogens, um, dirty water started coming under a bit more suspicion and the River Avon itself wasn't getting any cleaner. Um, Bath, like everywhere else, was increasingly industrialised, um, sewage went straight into the river, um, and this was the water that was being pumped up to be used for washing. Um, not so bad in the winter, but in the summer it would get pretty ripe, and people started complaining that the laundry wouldn't be able to function in the summer because the water was so um, pleasant. So eventually it was plumbed into a mains water supply and the drains were rejigged uh, so that they flowed into the sewers. Um, so they did eventually end up back in the river like everything else. And the other major change was that the cramps accommodation for the superintendents, um, which previously had been uh, above the entrance, they were given um, a fairly large house out of the back of the baths and uh, a doorway was created so that the two could be linked. And this is where they continued to live uh, for the for the rest of the time that the baths were in use. And um, it was one family, um, two two generations of well, two two um, generations of a related family, the, the Cox family, uh, who operated it for its entire duration. And here they are. Um, this photograph was provided to me by a, a living family member. Um, and it's one of the great things about working with sites of this period is um, having stuff that's this tangible. Uh, this is this photograph was probably taken around about 1880, and it shows Henry Cox and his, his third wife Elizabeth and their children. Um, and this probably would have been hanging in somewhere in the baths, um, but was obviously removed uh, before they were demolished. So the military baths, they continued to be used into the 20th century, um, but they were gradually being uh, used a little bit less. By 1910, uh, the number of people using the laundry had halved, and this was causing severe financial strain. And the baths had never really been properly self-funded. The, the idea was that they would fund themselves, um, but they'd always had to have a little bit of a top up from the council, and this became increasingly so. The council kept topping it up and they were never really quite able to break even. The reason the number of people using the laundry was dropping, um, there's a few different reasons, um, but the main one was as Bath's suburbs developed, um, uh, those that could afford to move did so. You also had lots of industrial premises in the Avon Street District were expanding, so where people used to live were being knocked down and replaced by factories. So overall the population levels dropped. The people that were still living here um, there were much harsher enforcement of occupancy rates, so the number of people living in the houses also dropped. People had a bit more space. Um, lots of the people had access to water by this time, um, so it made laundering at home a bit more practical. Um, and being able to launder at home was obviously cheaper, so this was the reason the laundry um, stopped being used. The baths carried on being used right through the First World War, but by the 1920s, the number of people using the baths was actually beginning to drop as well, um, presumably because uh, private bathrooms were beginning to be fitted to the, um, the houses that remained in the area, um, and also because of the continued uh, reduction in population. And it was around this time that Bath Corporation began to draw up plans for the wholesale clearance of the Avon Street district. This was something they'd been thinking about for a while, the Haven Street District didn't really fit with their view of Bath. Um, it was it was a bit of an embarrassment, frankly. So they drew up plans for the wholesale redevelopment of the area. There was going to be a new hospital, um, a riverside park, 
um, and new model flats, the first of which did get built, um, they're known as Kingsmead Flats now. But the Milk Street Baths um, was demolished in 1930 and they very explicitly stated that it wouldn't be replaced. And this was probably, the, the reason for this is probably because public wash houses were very much associated with the poor and they wanted to make a, a clean break with the, the poor and dirty past. The new flats they were building, they had bathrooms um, and washing facilities. They just weren't needed anymore. So that's the story of the Milk Street Baths and it's just one aspect of the, the, the many different things we found in our excavations at Bath Keys Waterside. Um, if you'd like to read more about those, um, please buy the book. And if you have any questions about um, the baths or in fact um, any other aspects of the Bath Keys site, I would be happy to answer them now. Thank you.